I'm going to talk about urban squares as place for public life. And I've been thinking a lot about this lately, and I first would like to acknowledge the work I've been doing with John uh, on urban squares for the last two years, and he certainly helped shape some of my ideas in my thinking on this, so I'd like to acknowledge John in pr my presentation this morning. So, don't worry, not all my slides look like this, but um, it, it does give an outline of my presentation, and I'd like to draw on the importance of urban squares in public or community life. I'll be drawing on some of the language and theories from Jane Jensen in her ideas of social cohesion and some of the language about belonging and legitimacy and participation. And of course, the classics of Robert Putnam's social capital and the importance of community and collaboration. And then Mackenzie's social sustainability and that will help us understand why public life is still important. Squares, urban squares, town plazas, gardens, that we've heard many different names for the same place, are one key component in the public realm. And do they afford public life? In the old days, the town plaza used to be at the center of cities or villages, and it was a place for people to come and meet. And so I'd like to play on that a little bit and try and think about what the interplay is of place and those key social concepts of public life that I mentioned earlier. I'll talk about some of the traditional characteristics that planners or architects, landscape architects use when they try and analyze how people experience place. We use age and gender and socioeconomic status, physical ability, culture, and all those kinds of characteristics to try and analyze how people use place. I'm also going to try and suggest other ways that we can think about analyzing it and looking at non-traditional subcultures and how they can be used. The homeless, the skateboarding culture, guerrilla urbanists, the coffee cultures, and I believe I introduced Ted this morning to the new one of mammals, which are middle-aged men in lycra. <laughs> and that's how, how that whole subculture is, but that's another lecture. So I'm also going to talk about place and placelessness and our experiences as part of public life in urban squares and how the concept is very fluid, it's physically alterable, it's subject to individual perceptions and very contestable. So squares enable a sociability of public life. Here in Federation Square in Melbourne we see it's a place where people come together to share an the same experience. They enable public life to be on display, and there's no other place than like Times Square to see humanity on display where it's shared, it's watched, and you are involved even though you may be at the edges and be a flaneur. <clears throat> Squares offer a place to play and to celebrate, and that may be at a very local level with friends and neighbors. They also offer us a place to protest and to mourn, and perhaps in a more global sense. And there we can share thoughts and feelings, learn from each other, and of course, appreciate difference. Some are well-loved and well-used, and some are where they have existed in providing a public life for centuries. And then it becomes sort of this palimpsest of multiple meaning and multiple public lives. Others are less well used and less well loved, and they may be more useful in episodes of events and special moments. And it takes a longer time to create bank of memories and meanings for the locals and an international population. Squares may provide that shared outdoor living space like this one in um, Boston that's really just in our own backyard. Squares provide a welcoming attraction to international visitors. And, you know, we seek out these places and they help start to create an identity for different cities. We all know the bean is in Chicago and you know, when in, you hear anyone going to Chicago, you must say, you must go see Anish Kapoor's The Bean. And it's there in, in AT&T Plaza. Plazas also play host to special events. 
and that may be for both local and international visitors, and may afford the possibility of a rich cultural experience that may be multi-sensorial. Squares can engender a sense of community pride, whether authentic or inauthentic, and perhaps the Italian forum is one that may be up for debate that our local population may be very well aware of. It's where history is acknowledged, achievements and contributions to public life are recognized. Squares may represent a community value set, and I love this um, artwork by Robert Indiana in the City of Brotherly Love in Philadelphia. Squares remind us that a community has a history and that it also has very much a future. So when we experience place, my perspective is a phenomenological one. We have a lived experience of public life and it occurs in very public open spaces, in place. And as I said, city makers often use the very characteristics of age and gender and physical ability to analyze what's going on in public life and in open space. And with all the experts in the room, I'm very quickly going to skim over my working definition of place, where that is a positive emotional bond is created through experience, through a knowing of a place, and from in creating some value from that meaning. We see that in the next few pictures I'll show you, some of those traditional ways we look at squares. We immediately go to the more traditional ways of looking at it. We look, we look at children and whether they're creating memory in squares and thinking about what kind of future they'll have in that place. We see adults sharing just a shared experience in a lunchtime, which is that everyday social practice. It doesn't have to be the big events where we analyze. It can just be the everyday. We can look at the elderly, the men or women, and we know that they experience public space and have different public lives from each other, and they have a very shared history in a public place. We can look at abilities and whether they are familiar with place and people. And you'll see that my examples are from all over the world. And so it starts to say, is that place or placelessness and play with that idea? We can look at socioeconomic status and acknowledge place identity and value, as here in Santon or part of Johannesburg. Experiencing supposed placelessness is a reminder that, again, the lived experience in public life for me happens in a very public open space in supposed placelessness also. And so I've taken a look at non-traditional experiences of place through things like the homeless, John mentioned um, tourists and travelers, the coffee culture, skateboarders, um, street performers, the goths, the emos, the uni students, gangs. You know, there's different ways to look at who is using public space. And again, for the experts in the room, and especially Ted Relf, who we're drawing on, I'm looking at his 1976 interpretation of placelessness where it is homogenous, it is the same, it is often disconnected and lacks character. Is this placeless? City Hall in Boston and for the architecture group in the crowd, you would recognize that. It's lacking human scale, it's bland, it's bleak, but is it placelessness? Not for these locals. They are using a multi-purpose base for events. And it's interesting that designers are now, in fact, designing and ensuring new plazas have some flat, multifunctional, blank canvas spaces, which can be used or altered depending on their needs, their users, or the events. Is it placeless for these locals? No, they've reactivated it. They run a weekly farmer's market there, and it's maybe at the edges, but for the locals, it is certainly a place. We've all seen this landscape, the gray space in a city that could be anywhere. It's next to the famous Seagram's building in New York on Park Avenue. Is there any quality to this space? You bet, the skateboarders seek it out. They are in there all the time, and this was 
These are my own photographs, and these were several young people hanging out and taking pictures and filming themselves in this absolute um, placeless landscape in the middle of New York City. So they've reclaimed it for their own space. It's perfect for them. Let's look to Vancouver. Is this placeless? Is it boring? Is it drab? Is it bleak? They're all probably nodding, saying, yes, it is. But for some, it is their home. And everyone, I would argue, as would Lefebvre, if we draw on his work, has a right to the city. And whether we call it place or placelessness, it doesn't matter. It's their home. This could be the anywhere in the world plaza. Unfortunately or fortunately, it's here in Sydney. It's Oxford Square along um, Oxford Street. It could be anywhere. It's a bit dark, it's a bit dingy, it's a bit dirty, and it's a bit smelly. I'll just say smelly rather than it has a bad scent. It's uninhabited much of the time. But the new movement, you throw out chairs and tables and a coffee cart, and it's all of a sudden temporary placemaking. And it's called a pop-up cafe, and that sounds really interesting and like a fun place to go. And you never know who will be sitting there at those chairs. <laughs> Is this placelessness? Queen Elizabeth Plaza in Vancouver. And how many of these deserted, bland spaces have we seen in cities? Probably many. But they are certainly not boring for these street performers who animate place. They need bland, plain, flat spaces in cities in order to perform, to play, or to busk. I'm pleased that Ted earlier mentioned, well, asphalt. How come nobody mentions asphalt? And so um, I want you to look at this picture carefully. And it's like one of those diagrams where you're supposed to spot the seven differences in the picture. And so this is Yerba Buena Gardens or Plaza in San Francisco without a 2013 Oracle conference. Is this placeless? Many people would say yes. Now look carefully. Wait for it. It's the same place. And so 60,000 of the business culture came in into the Yerba Buena area and took it over. They closed streets, they closed plazas, and they set it up to be an absolute place for their business conversations in 2013. Going to the same place, Yerba Buena. Would a child look at this sign and think, that's the place for me? No, there's no swimming, no wading, no bathing, no camping, no, well, I wouldn't expect they'd have alcoholic beverages, but um, no feeding of birds, no bringing your dog, no riding bicycles, no flying kites, no team sports, so don't bring friends, no rollerblading, no skateboards, and no carts. And a child looks at that and thinks, that is not a place for me. But then at the same location, again, Yerba Buena, it's a fabulous place for the yuppies, for the young, the educated, the well-heeled in the middle of San Francisco and enjoying that place. So what is place for one is in fact placeless for another. And what is placeless for one in fact is place for another. And I'll look forward to Ted's um, comments on this and it's some ideas I've been playing with, but if you can remember Ralph's continuum of place and placelessness, and place is at one end and placelessness is at the other, I wonder if it should be a circle. Now, I'm a planner and I don't have those artistic skills in turning a continuum into a circle, but I could imagine it's a different shape. To, um, for me, I might have just put an arrow at either end and say maybe it's place, maybe it's placelessness, depending on your perspective. So in summary, Urban squares are a component of the public and community life, and it's important. Public life is still important. It happens in public spaces, and it's influenced by different experiences of place and placelessness. Squares do afford public life, and for a range of different publics, regardless of whether we use traditional perspectives or non-traditional characteristics of people. Place and placelessness is experienced as part of public life in urban squares. It is fluid, though. It's physically, physically alterable. 
It's based on individual perceptions and it's contestable space. And for the practitioners in the audience, I'd like to highlight my final point is city makers must be mindful when designing, building, and programming urban spaces. We need to afford public life for all in our 21st century, very diverse cities. Thank you.